This meeting is being recorded. Cool. And welcome to our participants as well. And happy International Women's Day to everyone. I hope you great have a great day. And thanks for spending our evening, your evening with us uh, today, talking about how, how great women are and what we can achieve in our career, both us in our personal life. So I'll let Moriam and Rina introduce themselves one by one. We've got Regan as well, but she's on a four hour journey back home. So we're not sure what time she'll be joining us uh, in case that she can't make it. She sent her presentation with a recording over. So I'll play that at the end. But I'll let Rina first introduce herself. We did introductions while we were waiting for you, oh. but I'll say it again. But, okay. uh, because people have joined, obviously. So I'm Rina Barai, uh, very pleased to be here today. Uh, happy International Women's Day to everyone here. Um, I'm a massive fan of women in pharmacy uh, and, a, and a champion, as you'll see from my presentation. So this is right up my street when I got this invitation. And I was like, yes, I'll talk to any woman about pharmacy and how we can get to different places. So um, I'm really hoping to uh, enjoy the listening to everyone else's conversations and answering questions today as well. Lovely. Thank you, Rina. Thanks, Rina. Um, my name is Moria Majala. I'm a final signatory pharmacist. I work in the pharmaceutical industry. I have done for about the past seven years. Recently, um, I've become a consultant final signatory. So I work with two main clients as their final signatory. I'll explain a bit more about that in my presentation. And I've also launched a company called The Industrial Pharmacist. And what we do there is we speak to pharmacists who may want to join industry, decide if it's for them. And if it is, then we help them start their journey towards starting industry, whether that's becoming a final signatory or in another area of pharmacy. Um, and just like Rena, I'm really a big fan of women in pharmacy, in, in pharmacy and in leadership, sorry. Um, um, and just making the most out of your career and having a good balanced personal life as well. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, Mariam. Um, yeah, once again, thanks everyone for joining and we can make a start now. So we've got Rina first uh, with her presentation. Just share my screen and I'm hoping that you'll be able to see this in slideshow, hopefully. Yeah, all good. Yeah, from the beginning. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Great, lovely. So that's my technical bit done because I always worry about that bit. Um, so firstly, thank you again for inviting me. And um, I always feel a little bit strange when I have to put a slide up like this with my photo on it and all the different things I've done in my career. Well, I sort of look back and I still remember being a student. I still feel like I'm still a student. It's really interesting. <clears throat> and for me to kind of share my story about pharmacy, I think I have to go way back to when I was very, very small. So if you can see that little girl in the doorway of the pharmacy, that is me. Uh, aged about four or five, so 40 years ago. I'll tell you I'm 45 years old now, so you all know my age. Um, <clears throat> and I grew up in the family pharmacy that you see me standing outside. So my parents bought this pharmacy back in 1979. I was a little baby in arms and we used to live upstairs in the flat. And um, my father was a pharmacist and my mother was a dispenser and, and they ran the pharmacy together as a family business. And I guess um, from a very young age, I was very lucky. I always knew that I wanted to be a pharmacist. I wanted to be like my dad. I was very close to my father. And um, apparently my first word was prescription is what my dad used to say. I doubt it was, because that's a very long word to learn as a toddler, but that, that's what he used to say. Um, and even I, I have a very sort of uh, a very clear memory of being asked at my nursery school what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said I wanted to be a pharmacist like my dad. And I remember that my dad coming to pick me up from nursery and the teacher told um, my dad and he was really proud. And I thought, oh, that's really lovely because I've got a very sort of vivid memory about that. And obviously that helped me knowing what I wanted to do throughout my schooling because it helped me to just focus. I knew exactly what I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. And during my GCSEs and A-levels, I kind of, you know, really loved chemistry, loved the sciences, and I, I was, you know, reasonably good at them as well. And I remember having one of those career talks, you know, when you go and you're school and you have a careers advisor and you had to do all these forms and stuff and they tell you what careers you'd be good at. And actually pharmacy didn't come up in mine, uh, but medicine did. So all my teachers and the career advisors are saying, oh, you must be a doctor. You know, you've got clever. You could go to Oxford, go be a doctor. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to be. I want to be a pharmacist. And they're like, oh, no, doctors are much better. I was like, no, they're not. Pharmacists are really good. And I felt like I had to justify it from then that pharmacists are really good. And, you know, I said, don't, I, don't worry, I'm going to be a pharmacist. I'm going to be the best pharmacist that I can be. I remember having to justify myself back then. And it's interesting because now, obviously, this is me 40 years later. Uh, standing outside the pharmacy that I run which is our family business and I guess I wanted to kind of share my journey from uh, you know university 
to uh, to where I've got to now. So for me, applying to university, um, you know, I was I was predicted good grades. So I wanted to go to the best university. And I said, oh, you know, at the time, Nottingham was the best uni and I really, really wanted to go there. So I worked really hard to get lots of different work experience in my summer holidays, to have a really good CV, to apply in my UCAS form and um, really wanted to go to Nottingham, passed the interview, got a, got a, got a place there. Um, but then just as I was about to sit my A-levels, my dad got diagnosed with cancer and we were told that it was going to be a, a very rocky road. So I decided that I, you know, living in London right now, I couldn't go all the way to Nottingham and be a student and be so far away from home. So I changed my plans and I decided to stay in London to be a student so that I could be close to home. I knew my dad wasn't well. So it's interesting how you have ideas and you have thoughts and you think, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then actually sometimes life gets in the way because you are a daughter. <clears throat> you may become a mother, you may become a wife, you may become a partner you know, things do change and priorities do change. And I always used to think, you know, I'm going to go to Nottingham, I'm going to get a great degree. And, you know, from that early on, I kind of learned that actually life doesn't always work out how you think it's going to work out. And so obviously I, I got my A-levels and I got into London School of Pharmacy, which is now part of UCL. And I had a really good time at university. And um, I remember um, one of one of the lectures we went to, they were changing from like a, rope, you know, rope learning lectures to a sort of style of um, you know, uh, problem-based learning. And I remember going to one of these workshops. I mean, what the hell is this? How am I gonna be a pharmacist learning about these problems? I don't want to know facts and figures and equations and things. And I remember going to see um, one of the lecturers at the time and he, you know, I said to him, I'm really struggling with this course. And I've, you know, I've wanted to be a pharmacist all my life. I'm just, but I just don't understand this problem-based learning. And I remember him saying to me, maybe you've chosen the wrong career. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, no, I haven't. Honestly, I really haven't. I need to prove to you that I haven't chosen the wrong career. And um, that, you know, I definitely do want to be a pharmacist. So I, I kind of muddled through university and in my final year, just before I was about to start my final year, my father passed away, which is obviously absolutely devastating for me because I was, you know, wanted to follow my dad's footsteps and my dad never got to see me graduate. And obviously I was starting my final year of university, which is a very tough year at university. Some of you are probably in your final year and, and know exactly what that feels like. Um, <clears throat> and it was a, a very tough time for me. And I remember um, it was my dad passed away a week before our interviews for our trainee year, which was called pre-reg back in my day. And again, you know, I'd had these high aspirations to go and do my pre-reg and trainee year in a teaching hospital in London. I really wanted to be in the best hospital, guys, in St Thomas's. That was my dream. And I remember going to that interview because it had only been a week since my dad passed away and I totally messed up that interview. You know, I was holding back the tears. It was absolutely awful. And it wasn't what, again, again, wasn't what I planned, wasn't what I hoped for. And the next day, I remember getting that phone call to say I didn't make it into the teaching hospital. I remember feeling absolutely devastated because, again, life wasn't going the way I thought it was going to go. But what was really interesting is one of the women who had interviewed me, she actually was the chief pharmacist at my local hospital, St. Helia, which is near where I live. And she sort of said to me, I saw your address and I saw that you didn't apply to the local hospital. Why did you do that? And I was just really honest and told her that I wanted to go to a big teaching hospital. I didn't want to go to a little hospital. And she said, what if I offer you a pre-reg at the little hospital? And, you know, at that time I had no choice. I hadn't got any other pre-reg. I'd had set my hopes up for this hospital, big teaching one, and I hadn't got it. So I said yes. And it was really interesting. So I started um, my trainee year there and it was a little hospital in absolute disarray. The, the, the lady who'd hired me on my first day there got sacked under some really dubious circumstances. Something really weird happened and bad and we never found out what it was. And so there were four of us pre-regs, trainees who'd started and we were just left in the lurch as we sort of began our trainee year with no boss, no direction. And <clears throat> I remember then thinking, gosh, what is this? Have I made the right decision? Well, where am I going with this? And I remember sitting down with the, the other trainees thinking, right, how do we make this better for ourselves? And we basically sat there and we created our own trainee program. Nobody was going to do it for us, so we decided to do it for ourselves. And we asked all the specialist pharmacists to give us lectures on different topics. And we asked lots of the nurses and the doctors if we could spend time with them and shadow them so we could learn lots of skills. And I guess that was probably my first kind of step into leadership where I realized, actually, not everything has to come to me. I can create my future and I can create my destiny. And it was actually a really important lesson back then to think about um, you know, how I thought I'd messed up that interview, but actually I ended up going to a little hospital and I learned more than I probably would have done a big teaching hospital where I would have been just one little person in a massive department. Whereas in the smaller department with closer relationships with nurses and doctors and different departments, I got to learn so much more. And that was really helpful to me. 
Um, so what happened then is that um, I spent the first five years uh, doing hospital for pharmacy. I did my diploma and I worked at King's College. I finally made it to a big teaching hospital and I started working at King's College Hospital. Um, so it didn't happen when I wanted to, but it happened a bit later on, which is how life sometimes works, um, which is another important lesson for you all. Um, and when I was at that teaching hospital, it was hard really really hard and you were doing on calls at night and you know getting phone calls throughout the night getting very little sleep I was studying to do my diploma and I was really stressed really really stressed and I remember going to see my GP because I used to get terrible heartburn and just all these other health problems and um, my GP at the time said to me um, <clears throat> Rena no one ever said on their deathbed I wish I'd spent more time at work and this was my first lesson from my GP on work-life balance because I'd got it totally wrong I think I'd always felt I had to prove something to somebody. You know, I'd lost my father. I was always kind of living in his legacy, trying to prove to people I'll be okay. And, you know, wanted to be in that good university, wanted to be in that good job. And I was always trying to do that. And actually I'd not thought about the fact that I was sacrificing my own happiness and self-care and, <clears throat> you know, my personal desires to just relax and be normal. Uh, in, instead, I was, you know, working as a superwoman and trying to do everything all at once. And so I think this is a really important lesson for all of you sort of out there, because I think it was a, a lesson that I learned a little bit too late. And I wish I'd kind of thought about that in advance, actually. Um, <clears throat> and just, you know, thinking about that career, I then decided to take over our family business. Um, so my mum had run the pharmacy with some pharmacists that we'd employed. And <clears throat> back in 2003, she sort of said to me, Rena, come on, you've done five years in hospital now. What are you going to do? You're going to take over this family business or shall we sell it? And at the time I was at you know, really enjoying my hospital career. I'd risen up the ladder. I was doing some really interesting jobs. I was a renal specialist and then I did formulary and I you know, had some really, really great jobs. I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to have a dead end career in community pharmacy. This is going to be really awful. Should I do it? And I, I kind of decided to do it begrudgingly. So I took over running our family business back in 2003 and um, I haven't looked back. I have a look back. I absolutely love it. Um, what I loved about hospital was that clinical side of things and that, um, you know, being able to help patients and help doctors. And I was able to do exactly the same thing in my community pharmacy. What was better is that I built relationships with people over a long period of time. So my patients have known me for 18 years. I now get 18 year old people coming in who used to be a baby when I first started. And that's really scary when they come in for their prescriptions. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I remember you when you were a baby. Um, and it's really, really lovely. And I, I've always enjoyed that community side of things because of that relationship with the patients. But actually, it was my first foray into being a manager and being a leader and having to turn a pharmacy that was quite sort of, you know, low items, quite sleepy into a pharmacy that did lots of services and, you know, really was out there in the community and really um, respected by local GP practices as well. So I worked really hard to do that. And I've always been the sort of person that didn't just want one day job. I like to just stress myself out and have a busy life. And uh, so while I was always running the pharmacy, I always did some other roles. So I used to um, work as a primary care pharmacist part time. And then I worked as a CPPE tutor part time, which I really loved. And it was while I was a CPPE tutor that I um, met a lady called Michelle Stiles, who sort of introduced me to leadership. And um, I, I remember applying for that CPPE job and I, I just had my children and I was kind of a bit brain dead after having kids and thinking, gosh, how am I going to go back to work? How's this all going to work? And I hadn't written my CV in 10 years. And I remember seeing the CPP job, um, you know, come up on, on an advert and an email that had been sent to me. And I thought, why don't I apply for a laugh? I haven't written my CV in 10 years. I haven't been interviewed in 10 years. Let me just apply and just see how I get on. So I challenged myself to write my CV, challenged myself to go for an interview. And if any of you ever go for a job for CPP, it's an all day interview. It's a very intense thing. You have to do a presentation and then you're pretending to be a tutor and you have to get on with all the other people that you're interviewing with um, a very very intense experience um, and I got the job and that was my first kind of thought gosh okay I don't need to be in a box of just a community pharmacist or just a hospital pharmacist you can have a varied career and a portfolio career as they call it now and where I uh, became that CPP tutor I met Michelle who was my boss then who told me a, a little bit about imposter syndrome which is a really interesting um uh, thing that I'd never really heard of so this is what imposter syndrome feels like it's where you are actually a lion but when you look in the mirror you see a little cat um, and it's where I had a lot of self-doubt about my leadership qualities about my abilities and I really didn't see the leader in me but for some reason Michelle who was my boss at the time saw that in me 
And I went, uh, she encouraged me to go on a leadership course, which I would recommend any of you do in your career at some point, because it is really, really uh, something worth doing, because it helps you to improve your self-awareness. You help to learn about yourself. You learn about different leadership styles and different qualities a leader should have. And I'd got very mixed up with being a manager and not realizing the difference between a manager and a leader. So if any of you are feeling any self-doubt, please do look up imposter syndrome, because I'm sure many of you have it. And today you look at a confident woman talking to you, you know, about her life story. But I was never that person when I was at university. I'd never put my hand up. I'd never say boo to a goose. If I went to a meeting, I'd never say anything. I'd just be sort of, you know, trembling in the corner and really admiring all those people who could just put their hand up and say things or admiring people who could stand up on a podium and give a speech. And I'd never thought I could be a person like that. And I guess I kept challenging this imposter syndrome. And yesterday I was looking at a um, LinkedIn post by Stephen Bartlett. I don't know if any of you know Stephen Bartlett. He's quite famous and does lots of really good podcasts. But he was talking about imposter syndrome and how we should reframe it as a growth moment. So whenever you have that moment where you're looking in a mirror and you think you're a cat, don't do that. Look at yourself and say, I'm a lion and I'm growing bigger. It's a growth moment to improve. It's not sort of trying to deny who you are. Um, so for me, I learned uh, a very important lesson about that leadership and where, where I need to kind of be. Um, and where I want to go. And at that time, as I was an emerging leader, as they called me, I got invited to a Royal Pharmaceutical Society event on women in pharmacy. And it was a small little event, about 10 women were at this meeting, quite high level. And I sort of turned up to this meeting thinking, gosh, why the hell am I here? All these people have got these big names and big job titles. They're the people I see on social media and you know, in the magazines and the journals, why am I here? And a, a lady came up to me and um, she introduced herself. She was the head scientist at the Pharmaceutical Society at the time. And she said to me, um, we've invited you for a reason. She said, look around the room. What's different about you compared to everyone else in the room? So I looked around the room and admittedly, the women were a little bit older than me. So I said, is it age? She said, no. And um, she said, look, look again. And I looked around and I was the only woman of color in that room. And all the leaders were female, but all, uh, you know, white English women. And she said to me, Rena, when you look at the profession, what percentage of women do you think are white? And what percentage are women of color? And it was a real eye-opening moment for me when I thought to myself, gosh, yes, all my colleagues, the majority of them are women of color, yet all the leaders are white women. How does that happen? And so it started a conversation about how we don't have enough diversity in our profession. First of all, we don't have enough women in high positions. There's a really funny phrase that I love to use, which is pale, male, and stale. And a lot of our leaders in pharmacy tend to be pale, male, and stale. Um, and we wanted to challenge that as a group of women in pharmacy, but we also wanted to challenge the women of color diversity because we knew that actually it doesn't reflect our profession and leaders should reflect our profession and, and the makeup of our profession as well. So that was a very early lesson for me about um, diversity, the need to push for it, the need to sometimes be the first woman in things. So for me, I decided to push myself and I applied for a board role and I became a board member of the National Pharmacy Association, which um, hadn't had a woman in four years, but when they'd had a woman, I think they'd only had two or three in the hundred year history, and they'd never had an Asian woman or a woman of color at all. So I became the first woman of color to ever be appointed to the board of the National Pharmacy Association in its hundred year history. And what was interesting about the role that I'm still in is that I'm the only woman on a board of 17 men, um, which is very challenging and very interesting. And something I hope does not happen in the future because why am I the only woman on the board? What, you know, where are all the other women? And I didn't quite understand where they all disappeared to and why they don't put themselves up for leadership roles. So what then happened was um, I decided to challenge that. And um, we um, set up a female leaders network a, a few years ago to um, try and encourage women to put themselves into leadership positions because I don't understand why we don't. And I think some of us maybe have that imposter syndrome and some of us maybe don't see the role models to then emulate those roles in particular. Um, so I wanted to kind of make sure that people, if I rise up to an MPA board position, I don't pull the ladder up behind me. I want to make other women come forward. So what I did was uh, with two colleagues, sorry, this picture's quite blurry, I've just realized, um, set up Female Pharmacy Leaders Network with two colleagues called Harpreet and Komal, who were again, both senior leaders in pharmacy and both had, uh, had you know, concerns around the diversity of the profession. And we really wanted to change that in particular. So if any of you are interested, it's a free female leaders network, you're welcome to join. And we run monthly meetups for women on various different topics that help women with their leadership. Um, 
just very luck quickly because I want to hear more from Maureen as well. I just wanted to end with a couple of things that I wanted to share with you. And I know today was meant to be about balance and what makes you feel balanced. And I thought this was a really nice drawing to kind of depict uh, work-life balance because there is no such thing as work-life balance. And the balance is whatever makes you feel balanced and the balance is what, what, you know, what makes you happy. There have been times in my life when my work-life balance was half-half and other times where work was bigger than my life. And then I'm probably at the stage now where it's very blurred. Um, and that's probably the nice place to be. And, and I think, especially as women, we are, you know, we have various, various hats we wear. We have many roles. We're daughters, we're uh, mothers, we're partners, we're, um, you know, we, we work colleagues, we're friends. We have lots of different roles that we play in our life. And it's really important to kind of get that balance in particular. And I just wanted to end with a couple of things. I wanted to share a couple of proud moments with you, which I've put in the wrong order, but this is one of my proudest moments. And um, I won Britain's Best Pharmacist a few years ago, and it was a competition um, held by the Royal Pharmaceutical Society voted for by patients. And when I won this competition, I tell you who I thought of. I thought of that lecturer who told me I'd done the wrong career, chosen the wrong career. And I thought about those careers people that all those years ago said, oh, no, you can't be a pharmacist. You know, you need to be a doctor. And I thought, no, don't worry, I'm going to be the best pharmacist. And there you are. I've got the plaque to show that I can be. So I wanted to kind of show that, share that with you. And then a very another proud moment that I had last year where we got to meet the then Prince Charles, the now King Charles, um, as part of the MPA board. And we had a, a celebration event to where Prince Charles held an event to say thank you to all the pharmacists for all the work they've done during the pandemic. So those are a couple of proud moments. And the last thing I wanted to share with you before I finish is this slide. Because I think if I'd known this back when I was a student, it would have changed so many things for me. Um, and just I wanted you all to sort of have a read of this slide and reflect on the things that are in your control and the things that are out of your control and make sure you spend more of your life doing the things that are in your control and don't sweat the small stuff that are out of your control because life has a way as I've shown you of going up and down it doesn't always work out how you expect it to work out but somehow if you persevere if you have the resilience and you have the self-belief and you get the work-life balance right that's for you you can really think about those things that are your, in your control, uh, improve your mindset and, you know, really give your energy to the things that get you to the place you want to be. And I'm going to end there and I'm happy to take questions as well. Thank you, Rina, for your presentation. It was so inspiring. And I mean, thanks for sharing your personal story as well. And that's a great example of how even in the beginning of your career, you had to kind of balance your personal and professional life and the impact that made but then sooner or later you realize that everything happens for a reason and you got the placement that kind of help you get better and get out as much as possible out from it so yeah thanks for sharing and it was just I was literally getting goosebumps throughout your speech and I was like it feels it's unachievable when you talk about it, but we can, and I can say for everyone that's listening to your speech that we can see how far you got throughout your career. And that just proved that we need to just get and jump on every opportunity, not only as women, but anyone in pharmacy to get to those leadership positions and find the role that works the best for them. Thanks again. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if I had listened to a talk like this when I was a student, oh, my gosh, I think I'd be the chief pharmaceutical officer by now. I was a late bloomer leader. You know, it took me a long time to tackle my imposter syndrome, to realize that I'm a leader, to realize I can speak like this, to realize I can stand and present. And I've had to fight many fears and I've had to borrow courage from other people. And it's taken me a while to get to where I've got to. And I just think anyone out there watching this, don't wait as long as I did. Don't let self-doubt take over, just go for it. And, you know, we live in a, such a better world now with social media, you can really make a name for yourself in such different ways. Um, so, you know, I really uh, hope people are listening and are encouraged by that. Thank you, lovely. Thanks for sharing that. We've got a couple of questions in the, in the chat. One is how someone can join the Female Pharmacy Leaders Network. I'll post a link to the subscribe, uh, to how to subscribe for that. Lovely, thank you. And the other one is, what does the leadership role at the NPA board involve? Okay, so the National Pharmacy Association is a national body that represents independent pharmacies like me that own, own our own pharmacies. Um, and it was really interesting. I don't think I knew what a board role was when I first applied. 
but it is actually um, it's got several different uh, sort of aspects. One is supporting the National Pharmacy Association to be the best association it can be for its members. So we make sure we um, you know, are listening to our members, we hold training events, we um, support uh, pharmacy teams to get trained, we provide insurance to pharmacy teams, and we offer new services and support pharmacies to start new services. But also there's a higher level of um, supporting community pharmacy in particular, making sure it's heard, so the advocacy. So the role for me has involved a lot of TV interviews, radio interviews, uh, you know, meeting Prince Charles, going to Downing Street, going to Parliament, lots of advocacy of really promoting community pharmacy in particular. And then I sit on um, Pharmaceutical Services Negotiating Committee as an MPA board member. And that is how we negotiate our contracts for community pharmacy. So that's, um, you know, with uh, people like the head of Lloyd's and head of Boots and, you know, the big, the big, big people are sitting around this table and we're discussing the future of pharmacy and what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. So it's quite a, a sort of higher level role to my day job, which is a community pharmacist where I'm talking to patients and, you know, you know six, uh, five and a half days a week, I'm in my pharmacy and uh, these meetings sort of are about two days every two months. Um, a lot of reading is involved as well, lots of board papers that you need to read and you need to just be able to kind of contribute to the discussion, know what's going on in pharmacy, give ideas, give suggestions and kind of be an advocate for community pharmacy. Lovely, thank you. Um, we'll just give a couple of minutes for any more questions. Oh, I can see one more. not a question it's more of a statement i think that the most challenging for us women who are also moms to balance between our duty as moms and our careers i agree it is you know being a mom is one of the hardest jobs and you will forever have mum guilt mum guilt is terrible because you never think you're a good parent you never think you're a good mom and then you think you're a bad pharmacist because you're just you know you just never feel good at anything because you just have many hats and i think um you know my tips are go easy on yourself um, sometimes the values we have at work are the same sort of values you have at home as being at mum. You know, sometimes I feel like a mum to my team and the pharmacy, for example. So you're using similar skills, uh, coaching skills, mentoring skills, uh, you know, uh, motivational interviewing, questioning, you know, that sort of same sort of skills you use at work, you can use at home as a mum as well. Um, but I think, my, you know, the, the challenge is very real. And um, I think there's something about the household responsibilities that always fall on women too. We need to challenge that. You know, the theme of IWD um, this year is embracing equity. Have we truly got equity at home? And I'm lucky I do, but there are many people where they are doing everything for their children. They're doing everything in the house, plus they're working. You know, something has to give if you are going to be working. You can't do all the washing and the dishes and the laundry and the homework. And, you know, you need to be able to share the load of all of those things. It's not just a woman's role to do all of these things. And I've got two sons and I always sort of joke saying I'm trying to raise modern men. They do know how to load a dishwasher. They do know how to cook for themselves. Uh, do they know how to start the washing machine? I'd like to think they do. Um, uh, you know, it is about sharing that responsibility. And I think um, I think some of that's down to us. Sometimes as women, we can be control freaks and we think we need to do everything for our children and do everything for our household and do everything at work. And sometimes letting go a little bit of those things. Uh, is actually the way to embrace the equity and uh, sometimes to be honest as well to say look I say to my kids I can't do it all you know I can't I've been at work all day I can't do all of this help me please and just having that honesty as well can be a, a good way and a good tip absolutely thanks Rina uh, we've got a couple more questions one is what's your advice for a final year pharmacy student make the most of being a student because work is hard <laughs> so that's my top advice um sleep as much as you can uh watch as much tv go out as much as you can because when you start working life is very very different um i would say your final year is obviously really important year academically and while it feels like the most important thing i don't think anyone has asked me what i got in my degree in the last 20 years of my career yeah at the time it felt really really important to me um like i said i wanted that dream job i didn't get it has it held me back no uh, if anything, it made me stronger and made me more resilient. So don't let that mark or that final paper or that coursework mark get you down. Get through your final year, um, head down, make good contacts with your lecturers, because actually another top tip is pharmacy is a very small world. You will bump into people forever. I still bump into people I went to university with, still bump into my lecturers. Um, you know, don't make enemies of anybody in pharmacy because it's too small a world. 
um, and you know, get your head down, work hard, get a good get a good degree, but remember it's not the be all and end all. And when you start your trainee year, go in with your eyes open and prepare to work hard because actually that trainee year is probably the best year of your life, the hardest year of your life, I'd say, but the best year because it's the year where you can learn as much as you can, be a sponge, make mistakes, and it's safe too. And then you're going out there being pharmacist ready on day one. And that's the kind of key for, for all of you. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, I agree absolutely because I'm doing my training year now and I already can see the difference between uni and work. You literally don't have time for anything. Mm -hmm. Like you've got weekends, but then you've got all the household stuff you need to do in the weekends. So you literally have no time. Yep, yep. But I, I look back to student days and think, gosh, why was I stressed? This is it was the best days of my life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got a few more questions. Uh, next one is, what work do you carry out in the PCN network? Okay, so the primary care network is a really interesting role. So I'm a community pharmacy lead for a primary care network, and I guess I'm lucky because I've been a, a pharmacist in um, in in the area um, where my pharmacy is for. Um, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I just removed my slides um, for, for a long time. So I had really good relationships with my GPs. And so primary care networks are um, a sort of collection of local GPs. They also employ pharmacists and paramedics and lots of different people. And I'm the lead community pharmacist for them. So whenever there's an initiative that's going on around blood pressure checks or uh, the community pharmacy consultation service, I get involved or trying to get all my local pharmacists together and, and the kind of bridge between the local pharmacists and the GP network of the PCM. But I'm also a, a chair of a integrated neighborhood team, which is something new that started last year. And it's where we're working within our neighborhoods. So we're working with social services, local charities, um, patient groups, residents associations to really talk to people about um, what matters to them and what, what's important to them for their health and well-being. For a long time, health and well-being has very been top down. The doctor tells you what to do and you must do it. But actually, this is very bottom up where we're talking to patients, we're talking to we're going into deprived areas where there's lots of health inequalities and we're trying to tackle some of the issues that really do need tackling. So that's the sort of role that I carry out with the PCM. Lovely, thank you. I'm just mindful of time and yeah. Maureen, you've got your presentation. Yeah, exactly, too. yeah. Uh, we've can got... I answer them in the, qu I can answer some in the chat if you like. Yeah, if you don't mind, Rina. Yeah, yeah we can always do that. come back, come back yeah, to them at the end as no well. Worries. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, I'll pass over to Mariam then to share her personal story with us. Thank you so much, Rina, for an amazing talk, really inspiring, as I knew it would be. And thank you so much, Emma, for organising this as well. Um, can you see my screen all right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. So as I've said, my name is Maureen Majala. Um, I'm a consultant final signatory pharmacist. So I've recently um, become self-employed and I'm working with pharmaceutical industry clients. I'm also a final signatory mentor, something that I've probably been doing for about three or four years now, um, but something that I've taken on as part of my consultancy as well. And I'm also the founder of a business called The Industrial Pharmacist, which I'll tell you a little bit more about as I go on. So happy International Women's Day to everyone. Um, the theme for this year um, is embracing equity. And the reason I wanted to highlight this was because equity is important. Um, but I think we all need to remember it's not just about receiving equity, but giving equity as well. So embracing it in all its forms. So equity might look like because I have a toddler who goes to nursery, my manager or somebody I'm supposed to have a meeting with understanding that I can't make a 4 p.m. meeting, but I'll be able to catch up with you at nine o'clock in the morning because I need to go and do the nursery run. And them understanding that I work just as hard as somebody who doesn't have to do the nursery run just yet. Um, and I'll just do my job as best as I can. But that also means as a manager, if for example, I had people on my team who are Muslim during Ramadan and they wanted to fast or they wanted to start work early and finish work early, that I understood that as well. So I think it's really, really important throughout your careers because your needs as an individual will change throughout your career. Um, and it's about giving that grace that women naturally give, but in the form of equity and making sure that you're giving it and you're receiving it. And sometimes in order to receive equity, you need to ask for it. Um, women don't ask for things as much as we could do so sometimes that involves being vocal about your needs and it might not be a need and it might be a desire it might be a desire to work from home 
four days a week as opposed to three days from week and it might not be something that you need to do but if it's something you want to do um then you know ask for it you you can't get it if you don't ask for it at the end of the day so that's something I think that's helped me throughout my career especially as a woman um, and I think women should be more vocal about it and should give it as well so um, I'll just give you a little bit about my personal story. Um, I'm Nigerian by background. I was born and raised in London. Um, didn't know I wanted to be a pharmacist as young as Rena did, um, but I think at about 10, I kind of knew. Um, I've got an auntie who owns a pharmacy in Nigeria, kind of thought, okay, this looks something like something that's familiar to me. Um, I always knew I wanted to go to the University of Manchester though. So that was really important for me um, to get into. So made sure I did really well in my A-levels. Moving from London to Manchester um, was quite a big move, but I'd previously been to boarding school. So being away from home wasn't too much of a jump for me, um, but really enjoyed my time at Manchester. I did get in. Um, it's something that I don't regret. Um, and sometimes decisions work when you make them from a really young age and sometimes they don't, as you'll see in my story as well. Um, but yeah, I love my time at the University of Manchester, made some lifelong friends there. Um, really good time. Um, Rena did mention actually about um, grades. I haven't been asked about what grade I got. So just a quick disclaimer, I didn't do a great job at university. So first and second year, I was probably all right. And then third and fourth year, I just, I was really stressed. And there were points in third and fourth year where I just said to myself, I don't really know if I want to do this anymore. Do I drop out? Do I stay in? Um, so I ended up graduating with a 2-2 and I was 1% off a 2-1. And at the time, it seemed like my world was ending. It seemed like everything um, was crumbling and that nothing would make sense. Um, I remember being at my sister's university in Birmingham when I got my results and I called one of my friends who's probably on this call actually. And I said to her, um, what am I going to do? Like, what's my life going to be? What's my career going to be like? Why have I gotten a tutu? Um, now I'm not saying I recommend getting a tutu. I think you should work as hard as you can um, because when it comes to competition, if you and somebody else have got the same level of experience and if it does come down to the grade, sometimes it will, um, that could be important. But it's just to say, it's not the be all and end all. Um, and yeah, don't don't discount yourself already if you're not going to come up with the best grades. Um, as I said, university really stressed me out. So I didn't think I would ever want to study again. Um, but funny enough, just before the pandemic hit, um, I registered for um, a postgraduate certificate degree in it's a very long title oncology in the pharmaceutical industry we'll keep it at that um and I did that but I did that virtually which, which was really good um because at the time I was pregnant um and I was just about to have my my daughter so it worked out really well and it's really helped me in my career I always try to point out to people who want to move into industry or who want to be final signatories that you don't necessarily have to have further education I know some people and when I say further education, I mean on top of your pharmacy degree. So I know some people who've gone on to do law degrees um, in order to make them better suited for a final signatory role, but it's not actually required. Um, and I think it's important to have that information before you take that on. So don't think there's anything wrong with doing additional qualifications or going back to university for you know another master's or another bachelor's or whatever you decide to do. But I just think you need to decide the reasons you're doing it for and make sure that you actually need to do those things before you take those on. So I'll just talk you through my professional journey really briefly. I was putting this together and I just looked at it and I was like, oh my gosh, you've had a lot of jobs. Um, and it hasn't even been 10 years since I've been qualified, but it's been an interesting journey. So during university, I always thought I would work in hospital. I went for numerous hospital interviews and just what I had interviews, but just didn't get, I didn't get offered a single hospital placement. I didn't get offered a single pre-registration hospital place. So I had two summer placements at Lloyd's Pharmacy in um, a pharmacy in Acton in West London. I did it there for two consecutive summers, thought I'd be able to get a hospital pre-reg, that didn't work out either. So I went back to the same pharmacy and did my pre-registration there. But it worked out really, really well. Um, I really enjoyed my pre-registration there. I learned a lot. 
And I actually met the person who introduced me to the pharmaceutical industry while I was a pre-reg. She was locuming on a Saturday and it was the same Saturday that I was working. So we met there. We're still friends till today. Um, and that's another tip I kind of give pharmacists. As Rena said, pharmacy is really, really small, but I don't think any connections that I've ever made in pharmacy have been wasted. There have been people who I've worked with kind of five, six years ago, and we bump into each other now, and we still help each other. Um, it might be kind of a WhatsApp message to check something, and it might be kind of, can you refer me for this job? Your network is really valuable, so cherish it. Don't make any enemies, um, and make sure you help people where you can, where you're in a position to. I think that's really important. Um, during one of my summer placements, actually, I did a medical information placement at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Moorfields Eye Hospital at the time offered two week placements which were unpaid and unpaid placements in central London when you're a university student are very hard because even if you're just thinking about travel I completely understand you know you have to spend that money to travel into London um, but it was worth it for me um, at the time I knew that nobody would apply for medical information so there were people that were kind of on wards that were in the dispensary and those placements were oversubscribed too so I just thought medical information I know a lot of people are not going to apply for that I'm going to do it that placement that was only lasted two weeks was what kind of gave me an entryway into industry so it's really important as well that you take opportunities when they're given to you no opportunity especially in pharmacy is wasted so just make sure you harness the skills that are required when you're working somewhere and they can always be applied somewhere else even if it's not in the same sector of pharmacy because I think all pharmacists need the same skills we might not understand that and we might use them in different quantities and in different ways but we do need the same skills so when I finally qualified I think I'd resigned to the fact that I was probably going to work for Lloyd's for the rest of my life. Um, I qualified and became a relief pharmacist for Lloyd's and I was fine with that. I was working in a hundred hour pharmacy in Dulwich. Um, it was a really nice area for somebody who was young. Yes, the hours were long, but you know, the commute, it was a straight train to my house. Um, I, I, I was just living life as normal at the time. Then something just changed. I think I'd hit eight months and um, some reasons were like, really like, I want to do something else. I want to try something else. All I've known is community pharmacy. Let me just see what else is out there. But some of my reasons were really vain. I had friends who obviously worked in hospital. They could wear heels to work and I had to wear flats because I was standing for 12 hours a day. So I kind of thought to myself, I just want to try something different. So I started applying to industry jobs um, and I wasn't really getting anywhere. Then I saw an advert for an associate editor at MIMS. So MIMS, you may or may not know, is a prescribing reference. So I think it's less used than the BNF by pharmacists, but some people prefer it, especially for OTC type things. Um, I got an associate editor role there, and that really gave me experience of speaking to people in the medical information teams in pharmaceutical companies. So again, this isn't a typical role that pharmacists would get. Everyone on the team was a pharmacist, but I think at the time we were about a team of three or four. So it's not going to be a common role. It's not going to be something that's heard of. But again, it really helped me in my steps to, um, to working in the pharmaceutical industry. So as I previously mentioned, I met a locum pharmacist while I was a pre-reg who worked in industry and we kept in touch. She just kind of called me one day and was like, look, um, I'm going on maternity leave. Do you want to cover me? And at the time I'd been applying to industry. I'm quite notorious for saying this. I say this every single time I speak about pharmacy. I had a spreadsheet for my applications. I was on application number 46. <laughs> so when people come to me and they'd be like, I've applied 20 times. I'm like, just keep going just keep going eventually you'll get there so the great or maybe not so great thing was at the same time that my friend came and said she was going on maternity leave um I'd actually gotten offered another job as well so I applied 46 times and then two came at once um one was back in Manchester um back so I was, I'd already started planning moving back up to where I was going to university and the other one was just outside Reading so I knew I had to move regardless it was just how far I wanted to move um decided I'd done Manchester a little bit I'd move out to Reading um so as an adult who finished uni that was the first time I was kind of moving out and working kind of by myself had to rent a place as an adult um yeah and just and just work and 
I had um, a very short interview because I came on the recommendation of someone, again, highlights the importance of your network. Um, and before I even got home on the train, I got a call and they told me that they wanted to offer me the position. Um, and I remember the, when they called me, the first thing they said was, you know, you know, really liked your interview. We'd like to offer you a position. And they were just kind of like, oh, the salary is blah, blah, blah. I can't remember what it was at the time. And I literally stopped in my tracks because I was not expecting that at all. It wasn't anything massive, but I was just expecting it to be less than what I was on in community pharmacy and at MIMS. And it wasn't. So I thought, OK, this could be good. I hadn't looked into um, salaries or anything, but I thought this could be good. Um, I probably started about two weeks later because I'd already handed in my notice at MIMS. So it worked out really well. It was a contract position and it was initially supposed to be for six months. Um, I was still there six years later. So I'd worked in various positions. Um, I worked as a medic after I finished a medical information, a secondment came up. Somebody went on paternity leave for four months. So I covered his paternity leave as a medical advisor. And then when he came back from paternity leave, somebody else was leaving. And again, valuing your network, somebody came up to me and was like, look, I'm leaving the company. If you want my job, I can recommend you for it. And it worked out perfectly because it was the exact same month I was getting married and I had to move back to London and the role was completely remote so I could work from home. So that worked out perfectly well. So I became a final signatory um, for respiratory and I did that for two years before I went on maternity leave. So after I had my daughter, um, I had a change of heart and I thought to myself, let me do something different again. <laughs> um, and I took a role as a medical advisor at a company called PRISM. So PRISM is an outsourcing company and they work with Big Pharma. And what they do with these pharmaceutical companies is they provide them with compliance services, um, final signatory services. And like I said, I'll explain a little bit more about that in the next slide. After about six months, I was promoted to the head of compliance services at PRISM, which was great. So again, going back to how no experience is wasted, when I was working at Boehringer Ingelheim, I was a mentor to another person who was training up to become a signatory. I had an amazing mentor, but it meant that I wanted to pay it forward to somebody. So Boeing at Ingelheim was my first experience at mentoring someone. And then when I became head of compliance services at PRISM, that kind of became a major part of my role. So that was great because it was something that I enjoyed doing. It was something I found fulfilling and rewarding. And even if it meant that, you know, I didn't work with people forever, being part of that like foundational training for them that acted as a springboard for their career that filled me so it was something I really enjoyed doing after I'd been at PRISM for about a year in total this was late last year um, I decided to you know become self-employed I decided I'd leave and I'd become a final signatory and there were two reasons for this I think the first one was I felt like I'd achieved what I wanted to do there so when I joined there we were a team of three when I left I think we were a team of nine and I'd built the team up and I'd been able to train people and I had experience at interviewing people like reviewing their CVs seeing who wanted the role seeing who didn't who was going to be a good fit for the team as well because it's not just about qualification sometimes Someone might look great on paper, but if they're not going to fit into the team, it's just not really worth it. Um, but, you know, I really enjoyed doing that, those kind of things. But I thought being a consultant, I'd have more, more control over my time. And I do now, which is great. So um, I, I'm now a consultant final signatory. So I'm self-employed. Um, I work with big pharmaceutical companies and I make sure that they're compliant with UK law, the ABPI code of practice. Um, and... I also, part of the industrial pharmacist is we look at people's CVs mainly who want to go into industry. So I've worked with like public health pharmacists as well who kind of think they want to go into industry. I tell them a little bit more about it. They're like, no, that's not for me, which is completely fine. But it's great because I get to build a bigger network of pharmacists and I can refer them on to another pharmacist I know who can give them a little bit more, more advice about their career. So really good. And I'm really enjoying doing that. So... People always ask, what is a final signatory pharmacist? People are like, I want to go into industry and they don't know what you're actually doing. So big disclaimer here, final signatories are not the only roles that pharmacists can go into in industry. There are lots of different departments. I know some pharmacists who work in industry and they work in industry um, in marketing or they might work in sales as a sales rep. Um, but a final signatory role um, is one that naturally lends itself to pharmacists um, because there's only two 
professions in the UK that be can become final signatories. One of them is a doctor and one of them is a pharmacist. So pharmacists have only recently been allowed to have all of the same permissions that doctors have had as final signatories. But I think it's been a long time coming. And I think with our attention to detail, with our concerns for patients, I think it, the role couldn't suit us more. So I think it's well deserved. And I think it's it's it made natural sense that pharmacists could become final signatories. So what a final signatory does is they make sure that in the UK, that pharmaceutical companies abide with the UK code of practice. So everyone always asks me, what does that mean? So you may notice that you might see an advert for paracetamol on a bus, but you will never see an advert for an inhaler, for example, on a bus, because in the UK, it's illegal to promote prescription medicines to members of the public and members of the public are gonna see what's on the side of a bus. So, there are different codes. So there's the ABPI code and that regulates what pharmaceutical companies in the UK can do. There's the EFA code and that's for Ireland and there's the FPA code and that's for Europe. And we have to work on that based on who your target audience is. The MHRA also have a guide called the Blue Guide and they've got some guidance in there as well for um, pharmace pharmaceutical companies. And what we check compliance on is everything a pharmaceutical company does. So before, a big pharmaceutical companies, and I won't mention any names, but before they release adverts or materials, or if it's disease awareness, or if you see a poster in your GP surgery, or even if you do see a poster on the bus, that's gone through a final signatory because we have to approve everything. Um, and those are kind of like the tangible things you can see, but then also events as well. So things like congresses, if a, if a pharmaceutical company is going to be present at a congress, I'm gonna ask them, you know, how long are you going to be there for? Are you giving people that are attending snacks? Are you allowed to? What kind of snacks? Can I make sure you're not giving them ice cream and you're they're only getting a cup of tea and a biscuit or something? So it's quite interesting. And I work with things as basic as like adverts in MIMS. You know, those are kind of things we review. But then I've also done like virtual reality projects as well, working with like goggles and teaching patients how to use their inhalers properly using virtual reality goggles. So sometimes it's really mundane but sometimes it can be really exciting and you know you'll see lots of different things so I love my job um I would recommend it to anyone who wants to do it um because of multiple reasons but on a day-to-day -day basis it's really exciting one thing I do always tell people is the major difference I think between being a final signatory pharmacist and being a community pharmacist is you do lack the patient facing element of it I have not seen a patient in a pharmacist capacity as part of my nine to five in years. And it's something you can't really replace. So if that is something that's essential to you, then being a final signatory probably isn't for you. The one thing I used to console myself is that when I was a community pharmacist, I only saw the patients that came in to see me. But now that I'm a final signatory pharmacist, the adverts that I work on, a doctor will see it and he can use that data to prescribe for thousands and all the doctors, maybe even millions of patients. So I know the work I'm doing, even though, and it is very different, you don't get to see patients on a day-to-day -day basis, you are affecting the lives of millions of patients for every single item you look at. So I think that's really important to note as well. So the industrial pharmacist, as I said, um, it's a company that's set up to help pharmacists explore their career options. So. Not everyone wants to join industry, but I think it's important to find out if you do or if you don't. And if you don't, that's completely fine. If you do, then we can help with CV review, interview preparation, and then training on the ABPI code of practice. Again, another disclaimer I like kind of set out to people, there is no standard kind of training course for the ABPI code or to become a final signatory. Most companies have their own kind of training system and then their own exam. So you could do five different courses, learn five different things, but still you're not recognized as a final signatory until you've started doing it for a company. So I say that to people because people are like, I've been looking for a job for two years and I did a course two years ago. No course is going to guarantee you a job. And I think that's really, really important to highlight. So the challenges that I faced in my career, um, I think the first one was getting into industry in the first place. So before I met my friend, I just didn't know any community, for, um, sorry, any pharmacists that work in, in industry. Um, and I think when you don't know any 
one that works in a certain industry that you want to get into it's almost it looks unattainable it doesn't look like you can achieve that goal because you don't even know where to start once you meet one person then you meet others and they can tell you where they started they can tell you the hacks they use they can tell you what not to do so I think that's really important again just highlights the importance of building your network then promotion and salary increases. I think it's really important. I think British culture, we're just not transparent when it comes to money. And I just think that's that's who we are. Um, I think it's really important, especially as women, to talk about salaries, um, not just because there's a gender pay gap, but because there will always be an excuse for why you can't get that promotion now or why you can't get that salary increase. And it might not be because you're a woman and it might not be because, because of the color of your skin. Um, I've had someone say to me before, you are just experienced as this person, but because we trained you in this company, you can't get the salary increase you want. So age might play a factor in, in, in that as well. So that was a challenge, but I think I've learned in my career to be really direct um, and be honest about what you want, what you need, what you want out of your life, because promotions and salaries do help determine what you can and can't do in life. And I just think it's really important that wherever you are, um, you determine that. Um, I've got a brother who's recently graduated from university and some of the things he comes out with, I'm like, your generation is definitely more like outspoken than ours and more verbal. So I'm sure like quite a few of you on the call, I, I probably won't need to worry about this kind of stuff with you, but just a reminder if you ever do forget. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is opportunities. So the best piece of career advice I ever got was from somebody who wasn't even a pharmacist, but she was quite high up in the pharmaceutical industry. And she said to me, um, whatever opportunity you get, as long as you're interested in it, take it. Be honest with whoever is employing you about your capabilities and what you've done. So don't lie or make up experience. But like tell them that you will learn on the job. And that's completely fine. If you decide that you don't like it, you can take a step back like nothing's gone wrong there just take a step back and you know you, you don't want to do that but it's really important that you take those opportunities that are handed to you I think having a good mentor is really important but again I always say this um, I think sometimes people put too much emphasis on mentors because mentors are usually people that you want to follow in their footsteps I think what's more important than a mentor is a sponsor. So a sponsor professionally is somebody who works usually in the same organization as you or in the same industry as you, but is usually more senior than you. And that person knows what your career aspirations are and they will take them into rooms that you can't get into just yet. So they might be having a meeting and they might be saying, look, we're expanding the team. We need three more people in this position. And if your sponsor knows that that's something that you could work as, they will say, well, Moriam's not in the room now, but I think she'd be great at this. And if that person didn't know, then you know your name would have never come up in that conversation. So it's really, really important that you share your career aspirations and you're open about them with people, especially people who can speak on your behalf in rooms that you're not in. So take any opportunities that you can, but also remember you can't do it all by yourself as well. Mentors are really important, but so are sponsors as well. And a sponsor might not be another pharmacist. It might not be another final signatory in my case. It might just be like a manager who really likes you and you've had really honest conversations about, but make sure you do that regularly as well. So work-life balance. Um, I think for me, um, it's these are like the three things that kind of keep my work-life balance. As Rena rightly said, there's no such thing as balance. <laughs> um, usually it's a mishmash of things. So I think my first point is to prioritize and I think that's just about yourself and then the second thing is to create boundaries so prioritize only you can decide what your priorities are and priorities will look different at different seasons in your life so when I was at university my priorities were completely different from um, when I first got married and they're completely different from when I've got a child so just prioritize and sometimes um, priorities might look like I'm new in my career, I need to be in the office because I need to be more visible. People need to know who I am. People need to know my capabilities. I need to be able to speak up in meetings versus I've now got children. I need to work from home so I can pick them up from nursery, for example. So only you can decide what your priorities are. And it's important that you do that first. Once you've done that, it's important that you create boundaries. So I've now, prior oh, sorry, I've now prioritized that 
um, picking up my daughter, for example, from nursery is really important to me. So I need to let people at work know in the nicest way possible. I'm unavailable for meetings between three and four because I'm doing the nursery run. But if you need me before three, that's fine. If you need me um, after seven, I might be able to pick up an email or two. Um, and I do do that. So I just think it's really important that you prioritize yourself first, know what you want to do. And then once you've done that, communicate that with people so that those boundaries can be put in place. The second thing is it takes a village. So um, I think it's really important that people get all the help that they can. I believe mums and women are innately superheroes, but I don't think it's something that you should necessarily strive to do. My mum helps with my daughter. If we need to hire care, we do. So I say, you know, pull on friends and family, but if you can afford it as well, outsource things. So you don't have to do everything yourself. Get people to help. Be vocal about when you need help because um, there are no rewards for suffering. <laughs> um, it's really important that you tell people when you need help. But also that village might include people from work and just saying, look, I can't take this on right now because I have other things going on and then they become part of that village. So it's really important that you understand you can't do everything yourself. And I think the last thing is doing something for others. I think if you become too engrossed in my career, my family, um, it almost seems like the world revolves around you and it doesn't. And I think it's really important that you remember that. Doing something for others will put more strain on your time, but it will also remind you that you're not here forever and you do need to help other people because they need that help. So um, I'm a local academy board member, which is just a, a fancy phrase for a school governor for a local primary school. Um, my children don't go there, my children probably won't go there, but I think it's really important that we um, help people, especially locally if you can, in any way that you can. And in the pharmaceutical industry is quite heavily regulated, if it wasn't, I wouldn't have a job. Um, so it means that in my work, what day-to-day -day work, I can't really help people in that sense directly, but being a school governor means that I can. Um, and I think there need to be more school governors who are women. There needs to be more school governors who are women of color as well. So, and there's no kind of age restriction for that. So make sure you look into it for something you're interested in. You don't have to run the school or whatever, but it's really nice because you do have some power, but that power means that you can um, ensure that the students that go to that school are getting the best outcomes, regardless of their family situation or their family income or what they face at home. You can make changes that make sure that school is a safe environment for them. So just make sure that you're doing something for others in the midst of all this work-life balance that we talk about. So finally, I'll just talk a little bit about my contact details. I do have a personal LinkedIn called Maureen Majala, but I do get a lot of messages on there. So it's probably best to email me at info at the industrial um, I've also got an Instagram account, which I've just recently started. But I think on there, I'll be posting a few more things about um, like placements and um, job vacancies for people who are kind of wanting to move into industry. But then the industrial pharmacist also has a LinkedIn account as well. Um, so thank you for listening. I hope this has been useful um, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Lovely. Thank you, Morian, for your lo lovely story and sharing with us. And it's just a great example of how wide range of careers we can take as pharmacists later on. And even though if we start our journey in community like you have, it's not necessarily means that we can't go into industry or hospital or a different role more kind of a more unusual role within pharmacy. So thanks for sharing that with us. I think we've got a few questions in the chat already. Um, the first one, I think that's Corinne actually. Do you help students with their CVs as well as get them into part-time work such as dispenser? I thought that was for Mariam because she was talking about how she helps people write CVs. So I, I don't mind al answering yeah. that question. Um, yeah. yeah, I think the CV should be as simple as possible um, because I know when I advertise for jobs, uh, I get hundreds of applicants and, it, you know, you're filtering through lots of CVs. So simple, clean, bright and with the key messages and the things I look for in a CV are people have got more than just education. Uh, I don't want to just see GCSEs, A-levels, degree. I want to see that they have had work experience, that they've had some, some, you know, something outside of work, some other interest, um, kind of that kind of worldliness. And, you know, I have this kind of thing in my head that I always hire for attitude and I train for skill. Um, 
and sometimes you can't show an attitude in a CV. So I've always uh, hired people as a locum to try them out and they try me out and I try them out and it's a bit of a kind of two way thing. So I always think if you volunteer to say to somebody, you know, I'll come and work for you for free for an afternoon, please give me a chance. That's sometimes a way to get your foot in the door because they get to know you, you get to know them. And it's, it's a two way street when you work for somebody, isn't it? You need to like them and they need to like you. Uh, so CVs are a difficult one, but, you know, keep them simple, keep them really neat and tidy and practical. Great advice, Rina. I'd kind of say the same thing as well. Um, I get people who have been qualified for a few years and they send me a five page CV and I'm like, a recruiter's not even going to look at this. <laughs> like, I know you've got all this experience. It's like, pick out the main parts, pick out the parts that are going to stand out and include that in a CV. Yeah, really good advice. Thank you both for answering that. So the next question is, during your roles as medical information specialist and medical advisor, did you feel your knowledge and expertise as a pharmacist was valued? Do you think your M farm contributed to a higher wage? And can you do this role with a bachelor's in pharmacy? Also, do you have, it's quite a few questions. <laughs> also, do you have uh, to do a, a ABPI course before applying to the final signatory? Sorry for the questions. I'm really interested in industry. No problem at all. So I'll try and remember all of them. Um, so the first one was, in fact, let me work backwards. Do you have to do an ABPI course before you become a final signatory? So there are no ABPI kind of approved courses. So the PMCPA, who's the body that runs the ABPI, they do do like a summer afternoon course, but it's like a one day course um, and that doesn't play a role. Usually companies have a process which they pass people through. And usually it's like you have a mentor, you practice on items. So you're reviewing materials, you're, you're reviewing events, and then you sit an exam at the end of it. For some companies that might take three, six months. And for some companies, they like to do it longer over over two years but it literally depends on the company that you're working in and it varies from company to company so there's no standard course that you can do but usually when you work in a company you're training to become a final signatory yes um, you will have to do some sort of training and then do an exam at the end of it you can become a um a medical information specialist and a medical advisor without having a, a master's in pharmacy degree to become a final signatory you do have to have a master's in pharmacy and you have to be UK registered with the GPHC um, in order to become a final signatory but there are other areas in industry that you can work as if you are not so don't let that deter you if you do want to work in medical information um, where my skills use the medical information definitely so a big part of medical information is communicating with other healthcare professionals. So, for example, people would call and say, I don't know, my patient is nil by mouth. How can I administer this tablet to them or something? So there were things like that that were kind of really practical. But then there were also things like literature searches. So I probably hadn't done a proper literature search since I was doing my dissertation at university. Then I got to work being a, me um, a medical information specialist. And then I had to do loads of them. So if somebody said, I've been using drug X in my patient for a different indication, um, and it's been working really well, I would do a literature search to see if I could build on that information. And, you know, sometimes you might have to submit that to the pharmacovigilance um, departments. And sometimes those could lead actually to new, new indications for drugs. So yes, you do use the skills um, that you get as an MPharm student when you get to um, industry. Sorry, Emma, did I miss any other question on there? I think you covered everything. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. So the next question was, uh, why is there always a taboo around industry of pharmacy? Why is there always what, sorry? A taboo around industry. Um, of I think um, because Big Pharma has, um, for a while, um, had a bad name I think you know there are people out there who still believe that big pharma has the cure for cancer and they're not giving it to anyone because they don't want to and because they want to make money we saw it play out with the covid vaccine people are still really apprehensive and I think when I moved into industry I literally had pharmacists say to me oh my gosh you've sold you sold your soul <laughs> like people were really like traumatized by the fact that I joined industry um, and I think how I get in get around that is the first thing is my job and my role is ensuring patient safety so 
I work with marketeers day in, day out. I work with people who are who their sole job is to sell that drug, whether it's from an office or literally going into doctor's offices to sell that drug to them and teach them about the benefits and the pros and cons about that drug. Um, but my job before they even get there is to make sure that everything they're talking about is compliant. So if somebody wants to create, I don't know, a document that says this drug is the best drug in the world since sliced bread, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hold on, you can't actually say that. And then I help them craft the words and I make sure that the data they speak about is um is compliant it's accurate it's fair it's balanced it's up to date so no so being a pharmacist and a final signatory i think works out really really well because yes there is taboo about the pharma industry but my sole job is to make sure that that information that it's shared that is the events that they have that everybody is is playing by the rules and is being compliant so i won't lie to you and say there's not um but I think once you get in, you just realise you're just like every other pharmacist in any other sector. Your job is to keep your patients who are at the end of that whole process to keep them safe. And I think that's really important to remember. Lovely. Thank you, Marian, for answering that. We've got someone raising their hand, so I'll allow him to ask her question, I guess. Hi, Hen, do you want to pop your mic on and ask your question or type in the chat? Sorry, I, I think I just put the, I raised my hand by mistake. Sorry, that's fine. Thank you, sorry. Okay, moving on. Uh, how would you recommend getting a sponsor and or a mentor? Um, I think it's important that you ask and I think you need to just be direct about it. Um, so with sponsors, I think managers usually fall into that role quite naturally. Um, but where they don't, I think it's important that you just say to somebody, look, you've worked at this company a bit longer than I have or you're more senior than I am in this company. This is what I want to do. If you ever see anything that you think may be of interest to me, please do let me know. Or if I'm not there, let other people know and I think you can be that direct um I think mentorship is a bit more um difficult because mentorship I think is a bit more proactive um and not I see some people who are like they get requests to be mentors all the time but the people who request to be for mentoring don't actually know what they want from them so I think it's really important to know what you want from someone because chances are if you're asking them to be a mentor somebody else is as well I think it's like identify what you want from that mentor mentee relationship and just make the best out of it and don't always make it feel like that person is giving to you so nobody's like you don't necessarily necessarily have to buy them a coffee or, or whatever but it could be as little as if they give a piece of advice don't waste it so you know sometimes you give people advice and then two years later they come back they haven't acted on it and they're asking the same question they asked two years ago that's not motivating for any mentor so just make sure that it's not a one-way relationship um and you're always communicating with people as well lovely thank you and just one last question before we go through regan's presentation uh do you work a, as part of a team or by yourself um, I work as part of a team, but I kind of work as part of a team in two different ways. So there are other signatories that I work with, but they might work with other drugs. Um, so usually we communicate when we're thinking about things like, what does the code say about this? Can we actually do this? What would you do if I was in this position? But with the drug that I work on, I work with a team of um, marketers, like I said, salespeople. Um, there are people who like their job is strategy. So it's people from lots of different backgrounds. Some of them a few of them are pharmacists but most of them aren't so I, I work with people who've done like English degrees or history degrees or you know other life science degrees um that have now moved into into the pharmaceutical industry so work as part of a team I do work from home full time um so on my day-to-day -day, I'm kind of at home but not a day goes by that I do not have at least two or three meetings and we're always talking to people on Microsoft Teams and stuff so um Physically, I work on myself, but um, as part of, I would probably say, two teams at the same time. 
Lovely. Thank you, Mariam. And thanks once again for sharing your story and answering all the questions thoroughly. I'll just go into Brigan's presentation now. She's still not on the call and she she apologized to everyone. She's got a long journey back. And as everyone is aware, the weather is getting a bit unpleasant recently, so it can be quite challenging. Uh, but she's been very kind to send her presentation over with the recording as well for us uh, to listen to. I'll just share my screen and let me know if you can hear it. It should be fine. I tested it beforehand. Okay, you can all see that. Lovely. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I want to apologize for not being able to be there in person. If you listen to this recording, it's probably because I'm stuck on some dreadful motorway in the snow trying to make a four hour journey home. Secondly, I want to commend you for just being here, for having the insight and the willingness to learn from others' experiences. The other women on this panel this evening are inspirational and I hope that you've gotten a lot out of it so far. So I wanna start by asking you a question. And the question is, what does women in leadership mean to you? And I ask this question because up until around four years ago, it had never even crossed my mind. I was ignorant or naive, maybe, to the fact that gender had any part to play in leadership. I just didn't realise it was a thing. I'm now much wiser. <laughs> and so I think back to 2019 when I was asked this question and I was asked to give a talk on it. And so at that point, I really had to start thinking about it. So why was I so naive and so ignorant to this big problem that we still have even now in 2023 of the gender divide? Well, let me explain. So I've been asked to tell you my story, who I am, what I've done and how I've gotten to where I am. So let's start with what I do currently. So I'm a lead, a lead pharmacist in a GP practice of around 16,000 patients. And I'm also the pharmacy lead for our PCN, which has got three practices in it. In a past life, I was a past BPSA president and I was also um, the lead for early careers for the PCPA, which is the Primary Care Pharmacy Association. Just a little bit of context. I've only been qualified two and a half years. And I tell people that because it really doesn't matter how long you've been doing something. It's how you do it that is important. So that's the who I am what I do part but I think what you're probably really interested in is the how I got there and you're right because that's much more important than whatever the label says underneath my name. So I started off in a very different situation to what I am in now. So growing up my sister is 18 years older than me and I grew up with our father figure which was fine. So I was essentially raised by two mothers, two strong-willed, hot-headed women. And it sounds really strange, but they didn't raise me to be a strong woman. They just raised me to be a strong person. The fact that I was a female never came into it. And as such, I never saw my being a girl or a woman as a barrier. And perhaps that's why I was so naive to this issue in the first place. I was always told that I was smart and strong and could have anything I wanted. So I saw what I wanted and I worked hard until I got it. So I was strong academically. I had a great social life. I had everything. Until in 2007, when I was 16, I went through a pretty traumatic time. My family did. And I spent the next five years in a pretty dark place, I guess, with no real home and definitely on the wrong path. And then in 2012, when I was 21, I had my son then. 
and I suddenly found myself a single mother on benefits living in a rough council estate where quite frankly I was scared to sleep some nights I had no qualifications and no prospects I sank deep into postnatal depression and whilst I was there I looked around at my life that looked nothing like I expected it would do and I made a choice to do something about it so in 2014 I started at Durham Uni and after two years on a foundation course relearning how to learn for a start and remembering who I had been before I then started my M farm so I fell into pharmacy by complete accident I knew I wanted to go to university the only course that was left that year was anthropology so I was doing a foundation degree in anthropology and I maybe got to Christmas time and realised, well, what kind of job does one do with an anthropology degree? And it was that at that point that I got out of the, the prospectus and I looked at the different courses and I thought, oh, pharmacy, didn't know much about it, but you, you can be a pharmacist and boot for 40 grand a year. That's more money than I'd ever seen in my life. So I thought that'll do. <laughs> so that's how I got into pharmacy and along the way I completely fell in love with it and if that makes me a nerd then so be it but at that time when I started my M farm I decided that I would take every opportunity that I would start my life again basically by going after the things that I wanted because during those dark times I'd learned that we have a finite time to achieve the things we want to and I was not going to waste any more of it. So I joined the BPSA as a first year which was one of the best things I ever did so you're definitely amongst the right company here and I did that alongside raising my son and studying for my degree. I climbed the ranks of the association and I was the president for 18 months um, from 2019. And then in, just going back a little bit, so in 2018, I was in my third year at uni and we decided to have a baby. People assumed that because I was the mother, I would take a year out. People said that I was crazy or stupid. And that's just the ones who said it to my face, never mind what got said behind my back. But I'm a bit stubborn and I wanted to prove everybody wrong. So I sat my third year exams after 37 weeks pregnant and I was in hospital with my shiny new newborn son when my results came out. I passed the year and then I sat my oral assessment that September after breastfeeding my baby in the car park outside. I wrote my dissertation in fourth year with him in one arm and my six-year-old in the other. And then about five months later, my baby started to have seizures. He was hospitalised and diagnosed with epilepsy, which was really difficult. Anybody that knows anything about that, watching your child go through something like that is, is a very difficult thing to deal with. And then not long after that, COVID happened and I'm sure I'm not alone in saying this it was a very tough time I was doing my pre-reg as it was called then in hospital and it was scary having to come home and shower before I even went anywhere near my children and even then I was scared I was going to give them something um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in similar situations and watching people I cared about die. It was very, very hard. Amongst that, the pre-reg training changed, the exam got cancelled, the provisional register happened. It just was a time where it felt like it was one thing after the other. So why am I telling you this? This really personal information? Because I want you to realise that just because somebody has a fancy title under their name, it doesn't mean it was easy for them to get there. It might have actually been very difficult for them to get there. And so don't look at it and think, I'll never get there because of X, Y, and Z. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've gone through. It just matters where you're 
going. It was a lot of tough times, but instead of giving up, I used the support around me and I didn't quit. I wanted to a lot of times, but I didn't quit. I kept going because after all of this time, I owe that to myself because finally I know my own worth. And that's the first ingredient to being a leader. Really understanding who you are and what you're worth and knowing what you're capable of under pressure. So that's the first question to ask yourself. Throughout my story, I always knew what I wanted. So that's the next thing. What is it that you want? And it doesn't have to be specific. I think we go through uni, we're a first year, we know we want to be a second year, and a third year, and a fourth year, and we want to do our pre-reg. And it's all very structured. And then all of a sudden you're qualified and you don't need to fit into a box anymore. For example, I always thought that I would be a hospital pharmacist, but actually I didn't really like it. And along the way, I fell in love with primary care. So for me, it wasn't the sector that I wanted to work in. I always knew that I wanted to drive change, to develop people, systems, mindsets. That's why I wanted to be a leader. And I got the roles I have now because I still have that mindset of nothing lasts forever. It sounds cliched, but days, months, your career, your working life, none of it lasts forever. So if a door opens, you must walk through it. That would be my number one piece of advice because you never know what could be waiting on the other side and whatever is on the other side it's not a dead end it's not a closed room if you don't like it in there there will be other doors that will lead you to the next opportunity and the next and the next so please go through them even if it scares you actually especially when it scares you I had to make some difficult decisions and ultimately some sacrifices, and I still do. So people say you can have it all, and maybe on paper that's true, but you can't have all of it all. So what do I mean by that? There has to be compromises, and those compromises, as a generalisation, are pretty specific to women. So... I never got to be a stay-at-home mum with either of my babies for any great length of time. There have been times when they've been sick and someone else has had to care for them so that I could go to uni or, or work or a meeting. A working mother's guilt is a real affliction and I'm sure I'm not alone here in saying that when I'm away from them, I feel like I should be with them. And when I'm with them, I feel like I should be working. I always wanted to be at the top of my game as fast as I could. I think partly because I came into it as a mature student. So I made those sacrifices and it took, you know, things like financial hits, paying extortionate amounts of money for childcare so that I could do my pre-reg on time. Should I have had to do that? No, but that's the current system. And so I made a choice. So what choices are you willing to make to be a leader? What are you willing to sacrifice to be in the position that you want? Now, you may not have kids. Maybe you like to travel a lot or you've got 12 dogs or a hobby that takes up a lot of your time. If you want to do a leadership position that also takes up a lot of your time and the old saying is true with great power, comes great responsibility so I have a team of 20 people and I need to make sure that they are looked after and thriving and developing and they're in the right place at the right time and if they make a mistake ultimately that falls back on me so there has to be a compromise in what am I willing to give up in my life to make room for that kind of responsibility so that's what you need to think about and it needs to be a conscious choice. You can't be pushed into something. It needs to be, I have chosen this because of this. Make sure that you're taking the time to make those decisions properly. And the next question is, why do you want to be there? Why do you want to do it? Because 
if it's just for yourself, then you're doing it wrong. You have to grow pretty tough skin as a woman in leadership. You need to think about how much do you care what other people think. So if I think back to when I ran for president in the election a number of years ago now, someone asked me, you've got kids at home, how will you be able to be the president? And I should add that my second in command at the time had kids at home and didn't get asked that question, but he was a man. So I answered the delegate with a very diplomatic answer, of course, about time management and prioritisation. But in my head, I was just shouting, you just watch me, just watch me do it. And that's when I started to realise that for us women, it's not just about being a leader, it's about being a woman leader. So the two things come together for us. And there's no point in being blind or naive or ignorant to that fact. We need to recognise it and we need to embrace it. Because even now, as much as the door is open for women to walk through, the perception that they can't is still there in some cases, unfortunately. So four years on from those elections, after being in the working world for some time, I see this all the time. Sitting in a boardroom full of men, being the only woman sometimes, having an opinion that's different to them. I see the effect that that has. If men are assertive, they're seen as powerful women, too bossy. And if not bossy enough, then too soft. And if they dare to complain about either, then they're too touchy. And so we can't win. And we fail to stand up for ourselves and ask for what we want in fear of how we will be perceived. I can tell you now, men are not worrying about that. Now, obviously, I'm making some generalisations here. Maybe there is some men who worry about that. But the vast majority of them will not from the conversations that I've had. So, yes, over the last few years, this has become very apparent to me. Little old me, who was very naive to the fact that this was even a thing, is now faced with it on a daily basis. And it sounds very doom and gloom, but I'll tell you a secret that I've learned. We can use the fact that we are women in power, sometimes, or the only woman there, and we can use it to our advantage. There are so many studies out there that show us that men and women perceive things differently. So let's use that to our advantage. Let's be the person in the room that has that other perspective. You know, our empathy, our selflessness, our compassion. I'm in the position I am now because when I started the BPSA, the president at the time was a woman, a mother, and she inspired me. And along the way, I've met other great women leaders like Rena, who you've met this evening, who inspire me. And I was determined that I was going to do that for the next generation, because that's how we promote women in leadership, one woman at a time. So find your community of people that inspire you. This virtual room right now is full of women and allies of women. Let us support each other. Let us cheer loud and proud for each other. There will be plenty of people who will tell you that you can't. Trust me, plenty of people. Let's change the perception. Let us tell one another that we can. Surround yourself with women who are winning this fight. I can guarantee you the conversation is different. So I'll go back to the question that I asked you at the start. What does women in leadership mean to you? Now, I'd love to be there so that we could have this conversation, but as I'm not, as I'm currently stuck in traffic somewhere, horrendous, I'm sure, I'd really like you to just take a moment to reflect on the question. Maybe you want to pop an answer in the chat. Maybe you want to write it down or just keep it safe in your head for later. Think about what it means to you now and in a couple of years, think about it again. I can promise you 
you will see change and growth. And in the meantime, I'll tell you what it means to me. Put simply, it's the future. Being a woman in leadership is not about being the boss or the best or earning the most money or having the fancy titles. Although all of those things are nice, let's be honest. That's not what it's about. It's about earning that position of power and doing good with it. Inspiring people, developing people, using those amazing qualities we have as women to lift not only other women, but other people to drive change and to make a positive impact. We know where we've been. We all have had struggles, both individually and as a collective of women. We're not there yet, let's be honest. But change is happening. And I've seen that myself in just a few short years. I see more and more women in these positions. And I think, yes, go girl. And it can be frustrating sometimes that it's not moving faster. But it is moving. And I don't know where this change will take us, but I know one thing for certain. We have this amazing community of talent, of brilliant, beautiful, strong, smart women in pharmacy and in leadership. And tomorrow and the day after and the day after that, well, I for one am excited to see what comes next. So, my last remarks, my advice would be this. Try new things, take every opportunity, and do the things that set your soul on fire. Be the leader you would have wanted to follow. I'll end on the magical words of Martin Luther King Jr. If I cannot do great things, I will do small things in a great way. Thank you for listening. Just amazing. I would like to say a massive thank you to Vegan for sharing her story as well, to giving us such an inspiring speech and motivating. And we'll all love her to be with us, but it's great that we, sh we can still hear to her story, um, even when she can't attend, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I think we can go back to the questions because I think, Morian, after your presentation, there was a few. I'm not sure if you answer them i type the answers to quite a few of them. oh cool that's fine lovely um yeah we can i guess we can get some more questions from the attendees uh they've got any more questions for both of you or individually it's great to see the positive feedback and thanks again everyone for joining us especially rena and Miriam and regan for agreeing to take part in that webinar. It's just such a great way to end the day. And it's just been, for me personally, I can share a little something, I guess, for me personally, because back in my country, we don't have Mother's Day. So on 8th of March, we celebrate both Mother's Day and Women's International Day. And two years ago on this day, my grandma passed away. So since then, that day became even more special to me personally, because she was a great woman and she was more of a mother to me than my mom was just because I was so close with her and since then that became even more of a celebration and that was where I got the whole inspiration motivation to do that webinar so I'm so grateful for all of you being here thank you oh, so much a lovely Sam. story yeah really lovely I, I mean I love Regan I think um her story is truly inspirational isn't it of that total resilience of being just you know, in that council flat, single mom to, to where she is now uh, is absolutely incredible. And I think if any of you out there are thinking you can't do this, just listen to that story again, uh, watch the webinar again, because if she could do it, anyone can do it. And, um, you know, but there's a couple of things like I said, I wanted to say while there's questions coming in, there's there's something about Regan's story, Morian's story, hopefully mine, there's a, there's a humbleness there, hopefully, that you can kind of see. And I think leadership is um, about being that humble authentic person and not losing that sometimes we see people get to positions of power and it kind of goes to their head and it should never become that way because like I said you don't take the ladder up behind you 
you raise others and when you raise others you're raising you know raise yourself and others at the same time I think it's really important that women support women and that it can be difficult that you know it is hard to not be liked sometimes and sometimes you are going to say things that people don't like but you've got to have the convictions of your own beliefs stay true to yourself stay authentic and stay humble and I think that's probably the way I don't know I've navigated a lot of the challenges that I've had I don't know what how Mariam feels about that no I definitely agree with you um as a woman, not everything you say is going to be popular. Um, but you know, sometimes you do have to say those things. But I, I, I like to say to people in every walk of life, it's not just about what you say; it's how you say it as well. And I think that humility kind of shows through when you are trying to be authentic and you are trying to be a good leader, um, as opposed to a dictator. So I think that's really important to remember as well. Lovely, thank you. We've got one question to Moriam. How do uh, how do you go about working self-employed in pharma? Um, so I definitely say that you have to know people before you can become self-employed. Um, I hate sounding like this because people uh, almost make it sound like, oh, because I had to work in an office five days a week, you want me to work in an office five days a week. But unless you're known and you're visible, you can't do it. So when I decided to become self-employed, the two people that kind of looked out for me and said you know and offered me work were people that I'd worked with previously and had seen me in offices and had seen the way I work so um usually it's word of mouth sometimes you can go with recruiters but at this point of being self-employed as a final signatory you do have to have experience and usually that experience is having worked um, across multiple teams in multiple companies for quite a few years lovely thank you Mariam for answering that um, yeah, we'll wait a few more minutes for any other questions. In the meanwhile, I'll just pop the link for our uh, event feedback form. If you guys have a couple of minutes to fill it out, we'll be very grateful because at the BPSA, you all know that it's a voluntary association and we're all students and trainees that put a lot of work. Um, so it's worth for as many students to benefit from those events as possible and we would love to hear about what you think went great and what what we can improve in terms of our webinar so if you can just fill out the form that would be great i guess i wanted to raise a point about what moriam said about having sponsors and mentors i think there's also something about having a buddy and having a network um those are two i've always had mentor and i've always had spent sponsors um some really amazing sponsors who've like you said got me in the rooms where i never would have got myself and now i like to think i do that to other people which is quite nice and it's that giving back but there's also something about having a buddy so every organization i've ever joined i've always found somebody that i trusted that's my buddy so if something hadn't gone well in a meeting or something hasn't gone well at work i had that person that i could always say can i just message message them and say can i bounce something off you i'm really not sure i handled this well you please be objective and tell me should I've said this should how could I've done this differently and that always helps you with your personal growth I think and then having a network so you know I think Regan said that as well find your community um, and that is so important because it's very easy even though we're socially connected by media to lots of different people to feel quite alone in pharmacy it's quite a strange career sometimes um, so just making sure you've got that network of uh, allied health colleagues or professionals or people that you can uh, kind of learn from, grow with, uh, complain to, get ideas from. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons we set up the Female Leaders Network too, because we realised that many of us, while we knew everybody, we were very alone. Um, and it's quite nice to have that network and kind of tribe and community to, to have people to fall back on. Lovely. Thank you, Rina. Uh, just a couple of comments in, in, the, in the chat box. Uh, thank you for all the pre presenters. Your stories are truly inspirational and motivational. Thank you more than those two words can convey. Thank you so much to all presenters and organizers. One of the most enjoyable webinars I've attended. Yeah, any more questions? I can just see, you can see the drop down menu for the webinar. I'll get it added as soon as possible. So just keep the link um, and I'll get this sorted. I had a question for Moriam, if I can ask her a question. Yeah, of course. <laughs> 
what would you tell your younger self oh it's gonna all be okay it will all work work out I remember multiple times being really um anxious about certain things so like when I got my degree class um when I couldn't get a hospital placement and there were multiple times where I kind of thought the world was ending but looking back now kind of and I know you kind of touched on this on your talk as well like not that it didn't really matter but it doesn't matter now um it hasn't made a difference to my quality of life I don't think my life would have been any better or any worse to be honest if those kind of things would happen so, and I'm you know really happy and content where I am now so yeah it will all work out in the end love that I think Thank that's you. so true and I think a lot of the students sitting there right now it's so hard isn't it to yeah. imagine what you're going to be like later on in your career Definitely. I would never imagine where I am where I've done what I've done you know the, the, the jobs I've done I never would have imagined any of it and I guess it's as Regan said you know if the door is open walk through it exactly um, Just keep and pushing. when yeah and when one door closes another does open even though it feels like the end of the world so definitely great advice from from everyone actually thank you Lisa. i could see a questions come in yeah No, unfortunately, there is no certificate for the webinars. We've got certificates for our conferences. <laughs> so if you want to attend those, <laughs> uh, but the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel so we can go back and refer to the, um, yeah, to the recording. How do you both think your ex experiences have shaped you into the women you are today? Oh, um, I think it's kind of worked both ways. I think. The career I've had has kind of shaped the person I've become as a mother, as a wife, as a friend, daughter, but also the other way around as well. So I think my career has kind of taught me that if I want something, I can achieve it and I should just go for it. So the type of life I want, um, if I've been able to get that professionally and in my personal life, I can do that as well. But also the kind of person I am as an individual, um, I like to I'd like to think that um I am somebody who likes to remain ethical and ethics are quite a big thing to me. So going into compliance and final signatory work for me, that kind of served that purpose for me in my professional life as well. So I think it's a two way thing, um, which again is why the work life balance thing is a little bit of a myth because you can't completely split it because I think who you are as an individual influences who you are in your professional life as well. I don't know if Harina wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, no, totally agree. And it's interesting. I remember quite early on in my career meeting a GP who just retired, actually. And she said to me, um, whatever you do, don't mess this up. Your 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 profession and your career gives you everything. It gives you your quality of life. It gives you the house you live in, the holidays you go on, the friend circle you have. Um, you know, don't mess it up. Don't do anything wrong. Don't do anything dodgy. You stick by your ethics and morals. Not that I would have. I don't know why she thought I would have because I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm like really straight laced. I always follow rules. I never break any rules. Um, but you know, I, and I just remember that advice being really sound as it does. It gives you, it gives you everything in your profession, and be proud of it, and and give back. Um, you know, it's very easy just to be a pharmacist, do your day job, and switch off and go home. But actually, uh, we should be really proud of our profession. We're the third largest healthcare profession um, out there, and yet still sometimes unrecognised. I still think of those teachers who said to me, "Oh, why do you want to be a pharmacist? Or should don't you want to be a doctor?" But no, you know, I, I am a good pharmacist, and pharmacists are good, and. I think for me, it's that uh, the, the day job of the experiences of helping patients and then still coming to my pharmacy and being grateful for the help I've given them and support the way I supported them. I think those experiences definitely shaped me. Becoming a mum shaped me, definitely. That changes your outlook on life totally. The various roles I've had shape me. And I think, you know, the, the way, um, I guess, to explain it is to make sure your experiences do shape you is to always have that growth mindset. Never be fixed in your mindset. Uh, you know we're all here to grow we're all here to change we're all here to evolve and I think if you always have that open mindset then you're kind of you know sorted for the rest of your life really it's where you you visualize a future that doesn't happen then you get upset or you think you should behave one way and you don't and you get upset so you know always have an open mind to everything lovely thank you both for your answers again uh the that webinar has been added to the event feedback form, guys. So if you can now go, you should be able to select it. It should be the bottom one. Um, yeah, thanks one again. Uh,
to Rina and Moriam and Regan for taking part in the webinar, for giving their inspiration and motivational talks. And I hope we cross paths. As you both mentioned, pharmacy world is pretty small. So I'm sure some of us will cross paths uh, in the future. Um, so yeah, we can call it a night. Have a great rest of the evening. Uh, and thanks once again for everyone joining and spending their evening with us. Thank you, Thank so you much for having us. us. Yeah, Thank really you. lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Wish you all well. Good luck with uni and trainee years. Go out and saw people. Yeah, and, and uh, look forward out. to reading your names. Yeah, <laughs> I look forward to reading your names and hearing about you in the future. So good luck to you all. Bye. 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 Hey, Emma, well done. I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Yes, I was. <laughs> Thank you so much for your help. No worries. I just got in from the fire alarm. I was like, oh my God, so much is happening today. <laughs>